Right. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm a big fan of collaborative design. In fact, most of the things that I build on the Wood Whisperer and in the Wood Whisperer Guild go through at least one other woodworker just to kind of identify flaws or come up with ways that we might be able to improve the design. One of my favorite people to do this with is my buddy Brian Benham. He's not only an incredible designer and a craftsman, but he's also really good at SketchUp. So when we do a Zoom call and we do a screen share, he could be on SketchUp taking the ideas that are in my brain and bring them to life in an environment that we can manipulate them and identify problems. So for the recent mortising jig that we just made, we had a couple of those calls and I actually recorded the first one just in case we would need it for something in the future. So what you're gonna see here is a very raw discussion between two woodworkers trying to improve a jig design. Now, honestly, I'm a little bit apprehensive about showing this because it wasn't really meant for public consumption. Uh, it makes me feel a little bit vulnerable for lack of a better word. Most content creators really show you the finished product. You know, they wanna exude confidence in their designs. Uh, but this is something that shows you the struggle that takes place before that point. And I'll admit that everything I build has that struggle included in it. I don't, I'm just not that great at designing. So I find it very difficult to end up with this finished product. So I apologize if in the past I ever made it seem like this was easy because I don't find it easy. So I'm really not sure how valuable this is gonna be to you, but I think if you're a new woodworker, or someone who struggles with design like I do, that maybe this will make you feel a little bit better and give you some ideas on how you can solve your own design troubles. By the way, this discussion was the very first one that we had, so we didn't really even get near the finish line. We had a few more discussions after this to get to the product I already published to you guys. Um, but the video itself is pretty raw. Uh, only a little bit of editing was done to cut out dead air and cut out time where we were either thinking or drawing. So let's jump into it. Wow, you got a lot of icons, man. Jeez. <laughs> oh, yeah, I. Uh, this is uh, a Revit. Uh, a plugin for doing photo rendering. Oh, okay. All right. That's why it looks so complicated. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to uh, throw out a couple of the things that came to mind first. So one of the main things we're trying to do with this is implement as much of their uh, micro jig hardware as possible, which means when I see things like his dados and the slots in that top piece that allow it to run front to back, I'm trying to figure out, well, how can we use their hardware instead? So what they have are these little... Uh, hardware th things where you got the little uh, turn turning nut hooch, the little turn screw at the top and a bolt and it goes down into a little elongated dovetail uh, that would go into one of their match fit dovetail slots, right? So one of the things I was immediately thinking about is instead of having these that big top platform riding back and forth on dovetails, what you could do is take the sub base and put a dovetail groove in that front to back. So yeah, let's re let's remove that from view for now if you if you want to take that out. That's not that's not the piece I'm talking about just in case that's what you were going right. to do. Right. But I want this dovetail uh so I can uh oh, you you're, have to redraw it. You're stealing it. I got yeah, you. Yeah, I'm stealing it. Take that guy and put that in the sub base. And if there were a slot there, that would allow sliding in the slot front to back. All right. And so you're thinking just just a slot somewhere in here. That's it. So if that slot is cut square, it will, and you would do two of them, right? Just to keep it, because that top piece is basically acting like, you know, a fence. So we want it to maintain um, parallelism as much as possible. So we'd have a slot on the just like he has with his um, little add-on hardwood runner. You would have a slot on each side. So am I got these kind of place where you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Somewhere in that area. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then the top plate that would go on top of that and essentially ride back and forth would have, I'm guessing they wouldn't really need a slot. What they would need is a single hole, which let's call it a quarter inch hole because I'm pretty sure that the bolt that they use is a quarter, quarter 20. So if you had a quarter 20 hole that's in alignment, perfect alignment with that dovetail slot, then you could use one of their, um, Turny do doohickeys with uh, their dovetail nut, I guess is what you would call it. So they sell this little hardware kit and it comes with like four or five different knobs that you could uh, use for various hardware purposes. Okay. So do you think we should center that on this plate then? Yeah, probably. I think that we'll, we'll refine that later because we need to, the key is as long as you can 
get the full range of movement front to back and get that little routing window to sit over various workpiece thicknesses. And what's the thickest piece you're going to put on there? You know, like eight quarter stock or something like that. You're never going to need to throw that top uh, guide, you know, six inches out. But again, that we could always refine that later. Really, I'm just looking to do a proof of concept converting from more traditional stuff that, that he has here to something that's more uh, fitting for their hardware. My thought is that would probably allow just as much front to back movement as hardwood runners would with a little less fuss. I don't know how well, I mean, we want to keep that parallel parallelism as much as possible. So the two bolts that are being engaged there, the two holes that we create are going to be pretty snug because ideally the snugger they are, the more likely that top piece is to stay parallel. But I don't, I don't know that it necessarily needs to be 100% perfect. We can always check it as you're using this thing just to make sure. Mm. But, I, but So that might be something if we can come up with a way that actually does make it stay parallel. I'm thinking if we leave those there, these doohickeys, because these are riding in uh, uh, some grooves already. Yeah. If we leave those there, that'll help lock it in. So you think in conjunction with yeah, those runners? Yeah, we have, we have both. Okay. Or that, if you don't want to do that, we could do um, uh, two holes. That's what I was wondering, if two holes would do the trick. And I, the problem with that is I don't know how snug that's going to be until we actually make it. What, what we know just by looking at this is the runners are going to be pretty dead on, but I'm not sure how just four bolts and the two dovetail slots would be in immobilizing that and keeping that thing, you know, running perfect. Well, that's kind of the, uh, the sweet thing about the dovetail shape as you tighten it down, it's going to pull up into that dovetail and it's going to be kind of self centering. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. self, as long as it doesn't like, as long as it doesn't shift, like you bring it forward from where you think you have it. And then as you're snugging it down, it kind of, you know, cocks one way or the other, but it, it, I don't think it's the end of the world to, to keep those runners there because I mean, that's a no brainer at that point. Like even if they get a little less uh, snug over time or they loosen up over time or something, they're still going to relatively between the two of them, keep this thing. It was just like, if it were on a set of ball bearings or something like that's all that top should do is move front to back smooth with very little movement, but we can always double check it. So I think that might be one of the tests I would run in the shop is to cut a couple of these groove slots, uh, use their hardware, and just double check and see pushing it forward and back. First of all, how hard is it to push forward and back when there's a f total of four of these things in play? Um, do they, do they like torque in position or will it, will it run true? And if that's not enough, then we know we could fall back on those, um, the runners. Yeah. And looking at that hardware, we want to make sure that because that thing was kind of rectangular, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's spread out past uh, that. So we want to make sure we have this hole set back far enough that it's not going to interfere with any kind of mortising. Yeah. And if we have two of them, we want to make sure they're far enough apart that two of them can uh, occupy that hole. Yeah. Or that 100%. Slot. Now, the other thing I was thinking is the top itself is three quarters of an inch. This is a guide bushing system. So you would use like, I guess it's like a five eighths guide bushing that he uses. The problem, the problem I have with that is it's using three quarters of an inch thick material on the top. Is there any reason that we can't make that top thinner and go with half inch instead? Because the thinner that is, the more depth we could potentially get. So right off the bat with a three quarter inch top like this, we're eating three quarters of an inch in bit extension. Right. And also additional vibration and, and chatter mm -hmm. for having your bit extended that far. Yeah. So ideally, like if we could pull a quarter inch back from that by making that top a half inch thick, I think that might be might be better. And if we do what, what you're playing with there, if you do anything with the runners, they don't need to be more than an eighth of an inch, right? Like gravity is holding it down. The hardware is holding it down. It's just a guide. Yeah. So I'm just going to move these all the way down for now, just so they're out of the way. Mm -hmm. And then, maybe, a, uh, maybe a dumb question. It's all plywood. Um, if the top and the sub base are cut exactly the same, exactly the same time, exact same materials. Why can't you just attach like a, a strip, even if it's just a strip of hardwood to the side, it's, it would be screwed to the bottom platform 
not screwed to the top, and that would serve as your guide just to simplify things. Is there a reason you could think of that that wouldn't work? So you're talking you want something on the end here? Yeah. Like, what if you just threw half-inch thick end cap, glued and screwed to the bottom, no attachment to the top? And then if you have to, you know, take a hand plane on your top board and just take, you know, one pass until that thing slides back and forth. Is there any reason that is less reliable than a set of runners, which would be a whole lot harder, not harder, just more work to make? Yeah. I mean, more work, yes. It feels more elegant, though, than this. Certainly more elegant. But uh, this, I don't see any reason why this wouldn't work, especially if you get uh, some good pace wax in there. Yeah. I know it might have more of a tendency to bind because this, this, yep. if... Four if, points uh, of contact, right? Or four, four surfaces yeah, that are in contact. Yeah, you with have two. all of this contact in a very narrow space where this is just running on the edge so if this whole piece this whole top mm -hmm. piece just shimmies just a a little bit it could bind where good runners point. i think would prevent it from binding okay yeah good point pretend i never said anything other things i'm looking at the the top uh positioners or stops i guess they are those top pieces thinking in terms of their hardware and dovetail slots can we do something similar to what we did with the top where you would have dovetail slots cut into that top piece, which now I guess maybe the half inch might bite us in the ass at this point. Well, maybe, yeah, I was going to say they can go in the, in the base, but I don't know that you want that hardware going all the way through there. So what I'm looking to do is instead of having a slotted piece, which I mean, to be honest, cutting slots on something like that with a router is kind of a little bit sketchy. Um, if all we had to do was cut a dovetail groove in something and again, use their hardware to position those stops left to right, I think we're probably cutting it close with the depth of that dovetail, aren't we? Uh, yeah, because the um, that's about an eighth of an inch. What's it? So you you made, okay, so that top piece, the stop he has, that's half inch material, right? Yeah. Okay, all right. So that only leaves you with an eighth of an inch. So what I'm thinking is some way that you now have, you could have a, and I'm not even thinking of putting the dovetail in, in the stop itself. I would put the dovetail either in the base or the sub base and have that same kind of piece of hardware to allow it to slide back and forth. But I, uh, that's why I'm like glad I got you doing the SketchUp thing because there's subsequent downstream things that will happen that will either make that a really bad idea <laughs> or a really good idea. Well, fallback plan is to make the top three quarters. I don't want to, if we can make it a half, I'd love to. But if doing something like this requires us to go back to three quarters, then we go back to three quarters. What other hardware, do they have any other hardware that we could play with? So they have, of course, their regular clamps and basically it engages, they have a couple different styles of clamps now that engage with that dovetail slot. It's not really appropriate for this. All they have is that hardware kit, which is really just a series of different types of knobs and different size dovetail nuts, but they're all conceptually going to be exactly the same. They've even got the uh, a set of like dovetail track hardware where it's got the female track nut and then just a bolt. So if you just wanted something that's a little bit more fixed, but that's not going to help us. We need hand tightening here. Yeah, because this needs to be adjustable. And then the on this, uh, on the one that has the wide base with the big wing nuts on there, that would be ideal for, for this thing if we had uh, a slot in here, if we went back to three quarters, because now we're down to... Uh, an eighth here, I think. Yeah, I think it, eighth. it might be worth it to bring that back to three quarters if it means another opportunity to use their hardware. Yeah, and then also, I mean, I, it still also simplifies things a little bit. Making those um, through stop or through slots like that, is, I mean, even as, as long as I've been doing this, not my favorite thing to do, doing that at the router table. Oh, this drop, this right Yeah, like you doing yeah. a dropped cut with stops and everything at the router table is not, not my favorite. You could probably kill that little side piece that I had to put in there too. You'd have How to remove How far do you your... want to go before you hit this doohickey? Just we need leave, some meat. Leave an inch. I don't really know until we're like in the thick of it, but I think give us a little bit of breathing room there.
My daughter Ava asked me for a vanity, and I decided to make one out of cherry with some of the features that she asked for. Well, I kind of want the meter to open and shut, and I like bright colors. So we've got plenty of storage here, two big drawers. We've got two little drawers on the desktop, a couple of shelves, and then of course in here we have another shelf, some extra storage, and a lighted mirror. Yeah. Light it up. In this course, we'll cover a lot of woodworking techniques, including large panels, tapered legs, dowel joinery, wooden drawer slides, and dovetails everywhere. We'll also cover how to make continuous grain drawer fronts. Now for the first time ever, we're launching a guild course for only $29. Hours of video instruction, PDF and SketchUp plans, and all the benefits of guild membership for only 29 bucks. I must be nuts. If you want to get nuts too, head over to thewoodwhispererguild.com and sign up for the pre-order. The course launches on September 13th. Is that going to oh. be a problem? We cross that. Uh, that's the uh, front to back stop. Front to back slot. I guess it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't think, think so. it matters. Yeah. Okay. So so what it crossed is the 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 data yeah, for this, the runner, right? This data right there. But okay, yeah, so it, you would I just see the runner through there. But they're probably they're not going to make contact, right? If no, that's filled. No, especially since most likely the. Uh, the match thing isn't going to go all the way to the bottom. It's going to be up just a bit, you know, because mm -hmm. I don't think it's that that big. Right. Yeah. The hardware. I think they even I was looking at one of the videos that one of the guys did, and it looks like if you kind of as you're moving it, if you pull up just a little bit, it is it got a little bit of a play there so that if you have like crisscrossed ones and maybe the depths aren't perfect, it won't get snagged on one of those. So, yes, I think I think that's correct. Yeah, we might want to. uh um verify our final dovetails i don't not sh familiar enough with their line though but they say mm -hmm. dovetail clamp clearance height is 11 30 seconds and dovetail clamp groove height is three eighths okay so i'm imagining that 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 metal clamp is bigger than the uh the green doohickey things probably well and this will be something that with a couple of tests in the shop i'll i'll see where we're at dial and in I, yeah and I don't think, I mean, truthfully, for the front to back groove, anything from a 16th to an eighth in that dado is enough with gravity holding these two things together. It doesn't need much in terms of like height on that runner to be effective. So I wouldn't, I don't think it's too big of a deal. Um, right, yeah. And this is still a, a half inch. And that's, oh, the top is still a half. Okay. That's an eighth. Is that going to work for you? I think we have to be careful about deforming. Like, I don't know if taking that much away and only leaving an eighth of an inch skin, especially in the, you know, the zone near where we're going to be putting our router, if that is potentially problematic, I'm okay bringing that back to three quarters and then later on keeping it in the back of our minds. If there's any alternative way, you know, to do something slightly different that allows us to come back to a half inch top, then we do. Otherwise, we'll just stick with the default plan. So then the stops would then sit right on top. Uh, I think those stops could be anything. I mean, no reason to use quarter inch because we're probably going to use three quarters and half inch um, material for this. So I don't think we need to throw in another another thickness. Um, so probably, well, here's the thing. If everything else is three quarters, I'm making those stops out of three quarters. I don't see why I would do anything else. Like, yes, you can get away with half inch, but if I'm not using half anywhere else, I wouldn't want people right. to have, have to go out and buy half inch just to make a buy flat another stop. another sheet of plywood. Yeah, unless you just have scraps sitting around. Yeah, almost like we need a tape measure inlaid into this. That would be nice too, huh? Yeah, I mean, we as long as you... Slide this over. So I know watching Philip use it, what he does is the center line is very important. So he has a center line on the top piece itself. I mean, if you were seeing seeing this, you'd put a little V-groove notch or something in there. So we would have a center line in there. Um, he also has a little piece that he drops into that 5 8 slot just a piece of scrap that has a center line on it as well and he drops that into the slot so when the work piece is in there he can use that to do the front to back centering does that make sense mm -hmm. so th that's another thing i was hoping to come up with uh, somehow maybe i don't know how you would a better solution for that um because it seems like you're going to lose that little 5 8 piece that that drops down in there to to help you center I suppose if you have a center line on the outside of your workpiece, let's say on the outside edge of your workpiece, 
and you push it up, clamp it in place, and then you had a, the center line drawn on the underside, you would be able to look underneath and line them up that way, and then you wouldn't need an insert. So that might be one workaround for that. Yeah, I'm trying to think like just managing the clamps because you got to put it in there, you got to line it up on center and then clamp it down. Having a piece of wood just sit in there for me while I wiggle it around. Of course, that piece of wood is just going to wiggle around too. So that's sure. Not work. I think as long as it's snug enough and yeah. you got your piece in there, obviously viewing from the top is always going to be easier. Um, so then the other thing that he does is he'll have a, I guess he's got like a whole series of inserts that he makes where he's got the center line lined up. It's a fixed length and he basically just drops it right on top and make sure it's aligned with the center line. And then he brings his stops in and then that dictates the amount of, and this is, um, this is dictated by your router you're using. So it's specific to a particular router base because obviously the diameter or shape of that router base will dictate how much travel it has. But he uses these things when he knows he needs to make like an inch and a half long mortise. He's got this one ready to go center line, line it up, bring your stops in, and then he could just drop his router in and go. So, I mean, that's a good solution, but again, it's going to be very, you know, got to give him the formula basically to, to figure out how to get a mortise of a particular size based on any particular router base. Yeah. I don't really have a solution f solution for that. It's going to be kind of a cumbersome mm -hmm. um, operation either way. I feel like we could probably make this a little longer. So one other thing I was thinking of when you're holding the pieces up against that uh, vertical piece, right? So that's using the whole match fit clamp system. You hold it in there. Um, just thinking in terms of if I, I were doing a project, typically you have multiple parts. I realize we have center lines, but I really would only want to rely on that center line for the first one. I don't want to mark up all my pieces. So you could like do something to draw a line and just make sure every piece is on that. But why not also use their hardware um, and make a fence so that you could have like a vertical piece ah, uh, yeah, with a couple pieces of hardware that would slide into two of the grooves. <clears throat> and then you could just lock that sucker in place, check it for square. You know, obviously the grid is square, so you could always check against some of those grooves, but you basically would just have a piece of scrap that you can clamp down top and bottom. And then now almost like you're doing like a vertical cut at the drill press or something, right? Like something that you could reference off of and it can slide all over the place. And that could come in handy, especially if it's done in such a way that it can it can um, go in an angle. So if you're cutting angled pieces or oddly shaped pieces, you could probably cut a whole series of fences, like cut one that's a little short so that it doesn't touch the top. And then you might be able to like angle it 10, 15, 20 degrees if you're working with a, a piece with an angle on the end. So I don't think we even need to do two because... You know the um, all those uh, oval cutting jigs. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So basically, they work on this grid type concept, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. and there's only two pivot points. So yep. you could uh, basically uh, still have. I think we should still have just this square edge. So you always have a square edge, but then this side, right? Well, if you had a pivot point, whoops. If you have a, had a pivot point here, and then another one down here. Mm -hmm. You could turn this guy to set your angles, and then this curve would allow it to spin around. Is there any reason not to curve both corners so that it can go in both directions? Because the fact that it touches the top, that doesn't really hurt or help us. In fact, I would intentionally make it a little bit shy of the top so there's no chance of contact. Because that's really only there to just, I guess, unless you had a really, really tiny workpiece, but you're probably yeah. not doing anything. I mean, that would be my small. only concern is I don't have a square uh point here to reference but if it's yeah, this is only an inch so worst case scenario i mean if you're doing the square piece like that you're probably i mean every use case is different but you could always flip it flip it over yeah especially you know? if these two are the same and it's a distance. sacrificial part honestly like if it doesn't right. work then grab another piece of scrap drill two holes and you'll be fine and that's the one to thing a, when i'm i was watching that watching his thing in use i'm like yeah but where's the repeatability like in terms of positioning the workpiece, you're never going to do one. You probably got eight of these and you got to do both sides. So how do you make sure you get that done? Right. So that seems to be like, yeah. And I would probably make two of them. So you could potentially have one on each side in case you have to do 
you know, a left and right version of a thing. And, and that would even come in handy if you're positioning, let's say you're doing the leg side of a mortise. So you're dropping that piece in and it would serve as a stop. You know, you would just push it over closer to where the mortise is and you're, you know, coming down a half inch from the top of the leg or something that stop would come in handy for that too. And I think if you get real creative with this, imagine you've got curved pieces, um, bent lamination parts that you need to make something in, or, you know, the back of a, you know, curved back chair or something. And you want to put a mortise in the end, just having this surface with multiple work holding options would be pretty, pretty nifty. So do you need, how much motion can you get, or like how much of an angle can you get with something like this? So you would have to engage one of the vertical things, right? Like, I guess if I had this in my hands, it would be so much easier to understand. But as you're turning, if you really want to. Oh, right. Know, Cause this one is going to come off. Yeah. So my current setup's not going to work. You're right. So you got to have a vertical uh, dovetail groove underneath that because the top one would be coming down and the bottom one is going to the right in order for yeah. that to work. Oh, whoops. I'm not spinning. Yeah. So let's see here. So yeah, this bottom one's going to come off that, that groove. So, so that's going to make it hard to uh, set um, your distance though, from your center. Yeah. You can that, get an angle, but you may not get the right distance. That vertical line needs to land on wherever you want that angle to land. Does anything improve if the stop is slotted in some way? So, so. let's, okay. So let's do this. There you go. So if that if that has two vertical slots, then you could just stay in those two horizontal ones on the base and the stop can move. Yes. Yeah, so there you go. So you have mm -hmm. depending on how how big we make that slot, you'll have full full range of motion. So I think we'd want to at least get to like 45 and as long as we cover the range of motion to 45 degrees, I think that covers your bases. Yeah, I think we should go a slot up here though. Mm -hmm. So that way we can make this slot bigger. Yeah. Genius. So we go like this. Yeah. So now wherever we're at on this slot right here. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. There's 45. There you go. And whatever direction we want to go. I mean, we could just extend this however long we want to. And of course, to be able well, to yeah. clamp it to the workbench, we would have to extend this. Yeah, and I like the idea of extending out too, because then you could use traditional clamps. You could use um, uh, hold fast if you need to, like whatever you can secure it down with works fine. So we now have a fence idea. We now have the modifications for the top. And I, I think part of it is like, if I had this in my shop and I was using it, I would quickly identify things that we need. So I'm just wondering anything jump out at you that we might be missing in terms of repeatability. I love the idea of... Um, you know, some kind of a measuring thing. They obviously we can get a um, adhesive back measuring tape. Drop one of those in there if we felt that that was going to give us like accurate enough results. I mean, because honestly, your mortises never have to be. Very rarely do they have to be like a perfect number. You just get close, and then you just make sure they're all the same. So like, you don't necessarily need perfection. You just need to be able to go. Okay, I want that to be about an inch and a half. So now I lock my pieces in. It's going to be about an inch and a half, but what I know is it's going to be perfect on every one of these pieces. Yeah. What we need is a custom ruler that starts at zero and goes, you know, 10 inches or six inches in each direction. A center. Um, Do they make I, such a thing? I've I bet you someone one. does. At the very least, it would go to zero and then maybe give you like 12 inches, but it's a four footer or something that we could probably sacrifice. That off the end. Yeah. Um, cause that would be ideal mm -hmm. if you're just able to like, all right, here's my center line zero and I know my mortise plus my router base. Yeah. The one other thing is if you're doing something like a table leg, we can still use these same stops to go horizontal so that the, the leg itself actually has a little bit of support. So you can kind of slide that leg into a, a little channel, right? So I'm just double checking these can ju be just as easily used for a horizontal application as they can for vertical. And I think that covers our bases on that one too. Yeah. So we, we could easily uh, just make this 90 mm -hmm. and then yeah. extend one of these guys out to either side. Right. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. So now you could raise and lower it as needed. Yeah. And this would also do tapered legs somehow. 
Mm-hmm. If you had, it'd have to be like a shaker leg where it's square on one side and tapered on the other. Yeah. You could still do it. Yeah. And most of the time you're going to do that before the taper anyway. But if you didn't, it'd be nice to have some way to, you know, accommodate yeah. it. Or if it just happens, you have to put it into a tapered face. Okay. So then tenons, I don't know, man, is it worth it to worry about tenons? Cause I, ideally what you're doing is using this for both adjoining pieces regardless. And I, I think if you have, we think, yeah, this is going to work for angled pieces because you got enough bearing surface on the top, um, legs, aprons, you'd be doing the mortises into both of those. So converting this to something specifically for tenons gets, I mean, that's a lot more complicated because now you're dealing with varying thicknesses and then varying amounts of material that need to be removed. It seems like, yeah, it's a whole different thing. Cause right. The, the dimension of our mortise in this case is always dictated by the the router bit. We don't have to worry about much about the, the actual mortise itself other than it's the travel of the router. Yeah. So how does the the lead jig work? Is does it the lead uh not the lead dovetail, Oh the FMT? The, is that what that thing is? Yeah. Yeah, that thing was actually quite genius. It, I think it was just um too pricey. It was priced out of most people's budgets. Did he still make it? Because Lee Valley now has Lee jigs, right? Yeah, they did. They bought Lee jigs, uh, like last year. Did they? Oh, they have like a whole plate system that goes it's on plates. top of that. Yeah. It's inserts and plates, which if you have like a fixed hole and then you can control things that you could just drop in, it's really effectively kind of like, um, the, the, the Panther router or even the multi router in, in using like a predetermined, uh, template system and a stylus or something. So yeah, you right. would be, you would be using paired inserts one for a mortise, one for its adjoining tenon. And honestly, I have no idea a- outside of overcomplicating the hell out of this thing. I don't know how you do tenons. I, I feel like. Yeah. I think every- that's every- uh, asking too much for what we're, what we're trying to accomplish here. And then also yeah. at $1,400 of this thing, man, you halfway to a panther router. It's insane. Well, that's the thing. Like the, I think the domino and then the panther router, cause the multi router came out and was just super expensive. Uh, mm-hmm. for what it was, you know, the Panther router comes out, it's all aluminum and, or you make the version where you make your own. Um, and then you got the domino, which hit the market and suddenly like the older, like older school methods like this, just it's hard to justify the price just isn't there. Yeah. So yeah, the market was really turned upside down by a couple of those, uh, disruptors. I, I mean, I think this is pretty damn good. This is, um, I would like to find some more ways to differentiate from Phillips without making it like cumbersome or, or making it worse. If we can continue to find ways to make it better. And what I'd like to do is even further, you know, dive deep into the match fit system and make even more improvements on this mortising, uh, you know, all right, that's good. Um, I think we could probably wrap it then for this first iteration. Um, do you want to sit on it for a bit and see if anything else comes to mind? I mean, yeah. we made some pretty substantial changes, but I think if you want to um, throw out a copy of this to my inbox and let me see if if anything else comes to mind or any other problems. Yeah, I mean, come the to mind. the real question I think at this point for our current design is how big does this board need to be, and where are these vertical lines on this side need to be to be able to turn this horizontal, mm-hmm. and also to make sure we can swing well anywhere on this thing. Right. Like how, how wide does this need to be? But yeah, yeah if I think of anything at, um, cause I'm sure like my mind is always working in the background. I'm sure I'll think sure. of something, you stumble know, on some content after, after I think <clears throat> about it a while. Yeah. Okay. And I guess dust collection. So design a nice little dust shroud and we'll be good to go. One that preferably hangs on with magnets. Yeah. I, we could 3d print something for yeah, sure. That would be great. Just hook it right on the front. Just a little cup <laughs> connects to your shop vac. I mean, it's not a terrible idea. It's beyond the scope of what we're doing here, but it's not a terrible idea. Well, you got two rails already right here. So that's your attachment point, right? Yeah. And Heck then yeah. you just, right? There's your dust dust shroud right on there. Yep. I like it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you're not going to be able, like, even if you use a Festool, you're not going to be able to collect much from above with a guide bushing. You're pretty, pretty much trapping it all below. Yeah, well, this is now that, now that I think about it. So, it's all going to be trapped into your mortise, it and is. your mortise is going to be pressed tight up against this. So the so only way you could do it out. is co- like this: is when I would grab the shop vac and I'd be going, 
at the top trying to pull yeah. it out of the slot. Yeah. Or you, you, you're going to take like an eighth inch pass each time and just clean out in between the runs. Yeah, ain't nobody got time for that. This is a dumb <laughs> idea. Why are we even doing this? <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. I'll have All to right. see how this recording went, but I uh, appreciate your time. And uh, let me know what you come up with on that and we'll noodle it noodle a little bit more and that i mean at this point if we even need one more meeting i'd be surprised this is that we got this pretty far along so knocked it out pretty quick yeah, yeah. awesome cool. all right thanks man appreciate it all right all see right later. see ya all right, so let me know what you think, because we could probably do this again in the future. We have these design conversations all the time. We just don't record them. So if you think it might be valuable, I'm happy to document it and uh, publish it for you guys. Um, the other thing is, Brian, of course, if you're interested in following that guy, I'm going to put all the info in the description so you could follow him wherever, Instagram, YouTube. He puts out a lot of content himself and someone that's a, a worthy follow. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.